It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. It's been a long time since I stood here. If you're visiting tonight, we want to welcome you. We want to invite you back any opportunity that you are able to come. And we would invite you to stay around after the worship service tonight and give us the opportunity to meet you if we haven't done so so far. You know, I love preaching. Do you know what I love about preaching? Everything. I, I love being a tool in God's hand so that I can serve him. I love being able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. That word gospel being good news. We have nothing better that we can share with other people. The gospel. God's power to save. And I love being with his people. And I love sharing his word with you. And I love the fellowship and the love that we have in this spiritual family. And tonight, it's just a blessing to be with you. You know, about a month or so ago, before the worship service began in the evening, Brother Jesse came to me and he asked me if I'd be willing to take his place this evening, while he was away on this gospel meeting. And of course, you offer me the pulpit, I'm there. And, and so I jumped on that, and Jesse gave me a sheet, and it had the dates he was going to be out of town, and my name went down on tonight's date. And I put that paper on my work desk at home, and every day it sat there, I was reminded of this upcoming opportunity that I was going to have the pleasure of speaking with you tonight regarding a small portion of God's Word. And all the while, as I was giving that some thought, as I was giving that some meditation, what, what should I talk about tonight? With each day that passed, my excitement grew. And it grew and it built until the date ever edged closer. And, and so I had this feeling of anticipation. Anticipation of being able to be with you tonight and to share with you the good news of Jesus. And so when I was thinking about what should I talk about, there's my lesson right there. Anticipation. I want you to think about that. When we consider the idea of anticipation, if you look that word up in Miriam Webster's uh, dictionary online, the word anticipation is defined as the act of looking forward, especially pleasurable expectation. Well, yesterday was another important day because my daughter Sarah and her husband Michael and my granddaughter, Arabella, we're going to be flying in from California. Now, you want to talk about anticipation? You want to talk about excitement? And so this trip has been planned for several months. But as you can imagine, I've been waiting with bated breath for their arrival. And so now Grandpa gets to dote on Arabella and Eliana together this week. And, and so all of us understand this feeling I'm talking about. All of us understand what anticipation feels like. It causes you to look forward to events, 
or sometimes accomplishments, or sometimes the acquisition of some item that you want. If I were talking to the working folks here, one of the things I know you always anticipate, vacation. A break away from work, a chance to go and relax and just, yo, know, just let your hair down. It, it might be with the young people, summer vacation, or even graduation. You work hard at college, you work hard in your classes, and, and you will wait the graduation from one grade to another, or in some cases, to get that certificate that said you finished high school or you finished college. Some of the young people may be sitting here tonight with anticipation of getting married. Boy, that's always exciting. And so this feeling, you know, when, when I'm looking at getting a new car or a new house, Jennifer and Daniel just bought a new house. Or if you're getting toward the older time, generation, maybe it's retirement. But you know what? There's an old saying that says this, anticipation is half the fun. So tonight I want to ask you a question. What are some things that you are anticipating in your life? What are some things that you are looking forward to in your life? But maybe more importantly, what I want to ask you tonight is this question. What are some things that you and I should be looking forward to? With a feeling of excitement that we call anticipation. I want to suggest to you that one thing that you and I should look forward to with excitement and anticipation is being able to worship God. Last night, when you were getting into the evening time, were you thinking about this morning? Or were you busy with a game that you were playing or something you are watching on TV or you're out with some friends? Nothing wrong with any of that. But our mind should be looking forward to the opportunity that God affords to us to come together and to offer collective worship. I want you to look with me at Psalm 42, and I want you to think about what is expressed there in this psalm. Psalm 42, we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. And, and I want you to think about the figure of speech that is expressed here in verse 1. As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? When I look out over an audience... I can usually tell people who are interested in what's going on. And then I can tell those who are just there. Unfortunately, I know of some places that I go to where some of the young people, one particular, comes in with earbuds in his ear, wireless earbuds, and leaves them in during the worship. And I know what he's doing. He's not listening there to me. He's listening to his music on his phone. That's sad. I also look at people who are sitting in the pew and they're 
like this, and, and they have no more excitement. They have no more engagement than if they were at home laying in bed. But you know what they're doing? They're appeasing their conscience. I put my time in. I went to worship today. I want to ask you, did you look forward to today being the Lord's Day when you had the opportunity, the blessing, the privilege of coming together into the presence of the Almighty living God? and to offer worship to Him. I'll tell you, I'm usually preaching, so there's at least that preparation that comes with my Sundays. But there's more than that as well. Saturday night, I always get out everything that I'm going to wear Sunday morning. I always set out everything, my shoes, my shirt, my pants, my tie, and I get out my checkbook, and I write my check. Why? Because I'm looking forward. I'm I'm anticipating being able to come and to worship God. Does your soul... Thirst to be in God's presence. I want to ask you something. Maybe you're sitting there tonight and you're saying, yeah. Maybe you're saying, I I do look forward to it. I, I do anticipate it. I want to ask you something. Why do you anticipate it? What is it about coming here Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday or any other time, that makes it inviting to you. Well, the first thing we've already talked about here in this text, and that is that you and I have the opportunity to come into the very presence of God collectively. We should be worshiping at home as well. Sometimes I think we've got this idea that we can only worship together We need to be worshiping God throughout the week. But do I have a reason? Well, my reason is that I can come and I can be in His presence. The one who has loved me infinitely. You know, do you and I understand the love that God has shown to us. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the satisfaction for our sins. Now, if you have kids, I want you to imagine for just a moment. Would you take your kid and would you offer your child's life in my place? But more importantly, let me ask you another question. Would you take your child and give their life in place of your enemy? That's what God did. That's what the Father did. He sent His only begotten Son into this world because He loved you and He loved me so deeply. 
that he allowed him to come even while we were enemies so that he could redeem us from our sins. And so you and I have the privilege and we have the blessing of being able to come together this evening in the presence of God himself and to enjoy being in his company. But, you know, we also need to be here to say thank you. We just got through partaking of Lord's Supper, some of us. But that's just a little bit. It's the biggest sacrifice and it's the biggest gift that God has ever given to us. But everything, James tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 17, that every good and perfect gift that you and I have is from the Father above. You know, one of the things that Romans chapter 1 says about those Gentiles who were condemned there in Romans chapter 1 was that they were unthankful. One of the things that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 about why God destroyed his own people was because they complained rather than being thankful. Oh, this is so tough out here. We, all we have is this manna. We're tired of eating manna. Give us some meat. I get in a habit sometimes of instead of looking at the things that God is doing for me, I look at all the things that are going wrong or I get, look at all the things that I don't have rather than being appreciative of the things that God is doing for me. We have an opportunity this evening as we come together to thank God for all of these gifts that he just pours out upon us day after day after day. And we have the opportunity to be here with each other as this spiritual family. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves him also, it says, loves him who is begotten of him. First Peter chapter 1, Peter was talking there about the obedience of these children of God. And he says in First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth, notice what he says, through the uh, Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. It is an honor. It is a blessing for us to come into the presence of God to be able to offer thanksgiving to Him, but also to be able to encourage each other. I don't know about you, but I'm just going to tell you, I need help going through this life. And if it wasn't for you folks who have helped to hold up my hand and the family's hand through the hard times that we have endured over the past few years, I would not be standing. And I thank God for you. And so we have a lot of reason to anticipate and to be excited about coming together. This is not a social club. But we should love each other. And we should enjoy each other's company. We should enjoy the fact that we can encourage and uplift each other through this difficult world that we are traversing. I want to ask you, Is this how you feel? The psalmist said in Psalm 122 and verse 1 through 4, I was glad 
when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Are you glad? Are you going, oh no, I hope the preacher doesn't talk too long. You know, I, I see it all the time in audiences. You can't hide it. People are sitting there going, if you can't listen to me until I'm finished, how are you going to be in heaven for eternity? I won't be preaching probably. Thank you. And you'll be thankful too. But just think about that. You know, we, we're going, oh, the, the pews hurt my back. If you're at a football game, you don't do that. You sit there and, oh, yeah. But when it comes to the worship, oh, it's too uncomfortable. Are you glad when they say, let us go to the house of the Lord to give thanks to the name of the Lord? But what I really want to talk about, that's just the introduction. I'm just getting started. But uh, what I really want to talk about tonight is this. I want to ask you tonight, when you think about going to heaven, do you really, truly look forward to that? Look at this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 through 8, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you tonight, do you eagerly, eagerly await for Jesus' return? Now I'm going to put it kind of in a physical sense so that we can understand something. If there was a bus at the front door tonight going to, to see a Predators game or going to see a baseball game or going to a concert or going somewhere that you would love to go, Prince Edward Island, my family. If there was a bus out there and they were saying, all aboard, everybody, let's go. How would you be feeling about that? <laughs> I'd be, yeah, let's go, man. I'm ready. Let's go. But let me ask you a question. If there was a bus out there right now that said, we're on the way to heaven. You got to leave behind your family. You got to leave behind your house, your car, your wife, your husband, your children. But you're going to go to be with God. You're going to go and spend eternity basking in His love. How many of us would be jumping at the occasion, running out the door as if we were going to the football game? What I find, and I'm going to be truthful, what I find is that Christians say, yes, I'm excited about going to heaven. Unless it's time to go. And, and then it's really, I want to go to heaven, just not right now. That's a problem, isn't it? That's a problem because it shows me that there is either a misunderstanding about what is on the other side of this doorway that we call death and what we have to look forward to. I, I talk to a lot of people right now who are in the same situation that I am, who've lost their spouse. And we all are struggling. 
All of us are struggling with the loneliness and the grief and the pain. But we all understand something, the ones that I'm talking to. And that is, we would never want to call them back. Even as much as I want my wife back, as much as I want Becky by my side, I would never ask for her back because I know that where she is at is perfect love and joy and glory that you and I can only imagine, as the song says. And if I understand that, If my opportunity comes, notice the word I used, opportunity. If my opportunity comes to go to heaven, why would I not have that same feeling? I'm eagerly waiting to be with my Lord. I'm afraid. Sometimes... It's that we don't understand what's on the other side. But I'll tell you what I think most of the time is really the case. And is the real problem. And that is I've put my roots down here. And I've made this world my home. We sing the song, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasure are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. And we're good at singing it. But how am I if the Lord says, okay, Fred, it's your opportunity time. Think about this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 through chapter 5 and verse 4 are light affliction. We are going through difficult times. All of us understand that. This world is not an easy place. It does not act kindly towards God's people. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. That's where my eyes need to be. That's where my attention needs to be. Not on the things of this world, but on the spiritual goal that is in front of me with anticipation and excitement. For the things which are seen are temporary, he says. But the things which are not seen are eternal. And we know that if our earthly tent, our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he says, for in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed with our habitation which is from heaven. Does that sound like how you feel about dying? Do I really feel that way? Am I looking forward, desiring to be clothed with this habitation which is from heaven? If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked, for we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Are you groaning to be able to shed This fleshly body and this world of sorrow and tears so that you can be further clothed and that mortality will be swallowed up in eternal life. Very challenging, isn't it? I find it to be. 
Romans chapter 8. Brother Ray read that. And, and he talks about, in Paul does, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he talks about the fact that the creation has been subjected to futility. And that even the whole creation groans and labors with birth pains together until now. And the red part down at the bottom. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. You know, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the word adoption. I adopted three kids. My wife and I did. Adoption in our society does not have the same weight that it did back there. Because in our society, there's, you know, there's all of these social services that take care of kids who are orphans, and there's orphanages, and there's uh, foster homes, and there's all of these things that are there to help these kids. They didn't have all of that back here in the biblical time. And so if there was an orphan, they were totally dependent upon people around them who would supply their needs to provide shelter and sustenance. And if someone was kind enough to offer and to adopt this child, this orphan, that was huge. It might mean the difference between life and death. And God says here, we should be awaiting eagerly the adoption, the redemption of our body. I, I want to read an alternate translation of that verse. We believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with the eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We are children of God if we are Christians. We are the family of God. He is our Father. But the fullness of the blessings that God has in store for His children, for you and for me, is still in front of us. And my question tonight is, are you looking forward with anticipation to that. John chapter 14, Jesus was talking about his death, impending death, and, and he told his disciples, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And he said, if it were not so, I would have told you. But he said, I go and I prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When you love somebody dearly, and they are long distance away from you, you know how your heart pines and yearns for them. And I'll give you an example. When we were overseas in Slovakia, Sarah and Jennifer had to come back to the States so they could finish school. And we were separated from each other for years, not just months, years. And I remember sitting at the computer when I would be reading their email and typing emails to them, and there would just be tears streaming down my face. My heart was broken. It was killing me to be separated from them.
How deep is your love for the Lord? Are you longing to be with Him so that you can replace, if I can use the terminology, this long-distance relationship with Him? So that you can be face-to-face with Him and have Him and you be in His love and in His presence and enjoy the blessings that He has in store for you for all eternity. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13 through 18, I'll just talk about the bottom part, and that is when Jesus comes back, it says that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those who have already passed before us, and we will meet them in the clouds. And it says, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. What's comforting about that? Not only that you're going to be resurrected, and not only that the, those who have already passed are going to be resurrected, that's, that's part of it, but what I think really is comforting is the fact that you and I will be with the Lord and we won't ever be separated from Him. We will be with the Lord always. Notice what is written in Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. I saw this new heaven and this new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. The rest of that is great. I love it. God will wipe away every tear He's going to take away death. He's going to take away sorrow. He's going to take away crying. And there's not going to be any more pain. But what is so lovely about this is that God himself will be with us and he will be our God and we will be with him for eternity. That's what makes heaven so appealing. I ask you tonight, are you looking forward with anticipation? You know, when we anticipate something, we plan for it and we prepare for it. Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, let us therefore be diligent to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience, talking about the people of Israel who were not allowed to go into the promised land, the rest that was promised to God's people because of their disobedience. And he says, you and I need to be diligent so that we can enter into that rest. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. He said there in verse 10 through 15 that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. And this creation that you and I see all around us is going to be done away with. The elements are going to melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And he said, since you know all of this, what manner of persons ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the day of God, the coming, sorry, the coming of the day of God? I want to ask you something tonight. Are you looking forward to it? Are you saying, hurry up? When we want somebody to to, uh, hurry and come with us, hurry up. Is that how you feel about God's uh, Christ's second coming? Hurry up. He said, nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwells righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found in, by him in peace without spot and blemish. I ask you, are you anticipating the return of Jesus? Are you making plans? Are you preparing for his return? So that when he does come back, that you will be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless. 
He said in 1 John chapter 3, everyone who has this hope that we're talking about, what do they do? They purify themselves. They walk according to God's word. They purify themselves. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, he said that we were saved in this hope of the redemption of our body and hope that is not seen, sorry, hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, notice what it says. We eagerly wait with, for it with perseverance. That word perseverance means you just keep on. Keep on going and keep on going, no matter how much it hurts. No matter how hard the way is, how difficult the road, how much sacrifice it's going to cost, you're still going to continue on. Paul said this, and I want to ask you the question tonight. We're coming to the end, I promise. He said in Philippians chapter 1, he said, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I choose, I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I am hard pressed between the two. Having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Is that how you feel? Are you torn between being here so that you can serve God and save souls and being with Christ? Which is far better, he says. I don't know which I would choose, Paul said. I know that this is good, but that's better. Can you say that's really how you feel? I ask you, are you awaiting the return of our Lord with anticipation? Are you making preparation for his return? You know, Benjamin Franklin said this. He said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. Let me say that again. By failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. You know what I hear from a lot of people? It's the same thing that Felix said. It's just not a convenient time. Later, tomorrow, next week, I'll obey the gospel. If you're here tonight and you are not a Christian, you cannot wait with anticipation for the return of Jesus. In fact, you should be shaking in your boots. Because you need to understand that you stand before God tonight in jeopardy of your eternal destiny. And the only way to change that so that you can look forward to Christ's return is by giving God your heart and your life, coming in faith, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Christ, and being buried in baptism so that you can be united into the death of Jesus and raised in newness of life. If you're a child of God, but you've gotten yourself entangled in sin, you can't look forward to the return of Jesus either. The book of Hebrews says, all you have waiting for you is God's wrath. And so God is asking you, he's begging you to come back. He loves you and he wants you to be saved. He says, if you're willing to confess your sin and repent of it, he's willing and pray, he's willing to forgive you. I close with this question. Quote and my question. At the end of the book of Je- uh, Revelation, John wrote this. He said, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. And John's response to the idea of Jesus saying, I'm coming quickly, was this Amen.
You know what that means? So be it. And he followed that with this statement. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Can you say that tonight with all of your heart? Come, Lord Jesus. Take me home. If you can't, then changes need to be made in your heart and in your life. And if we can help you tonight to prepare so that you can come before Jesus and and wait for him with anticipation, let us know how we can help you. While together we stand and sing, won't you come?